all sorts of questions here. Diet, Dr. Pepper. That's what I'm drinking. Right. He doesn't drink. Oh, I'm just going to ask you. can't go into explanations. A lot, of, I'm gonna, a lot of the stuff's going to be out of order and stuff because later on it's going to all be edited, and okay. chopped up and edited. Yeah, I'm looking up this way because he's standing here. Right now. Uh, I'm letting everybody at home know this that's watching this. Well, yeah, but you, you know you're going to keep turning towards the camera. You're so camera where I can it while standing right here. Well, a, okay. There. Um, and also tomorrow we're going to go to Smoky Mountain, so all those guys are going to do interviews about you. Oh, um, Ryan's arranging and all that. I have a lot of, yeah. yeah. Maybe about the business or about, like, uh, what was he working on? Favorite Eddie story. No, Eddie, oh, Eddie, Eddie stories, stories or, you know. Bad Eddie stories. No, I, like, I'm not sure where, Eddie stories. I don't, I'm not sure where these guys are going. I know Funk, Cornette, Anthony, Yikes. hopefully Pritchard, maybe Ricky Morton. Just don't ask any of the girls that work over Tammy? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me go through a whole bunch of stuff here. Eddie, who did it went out, the light went out. Yeah. Yeah. There it came on. Came on. They went out. Something to the yeah, short. Short, the short in the light. Yeah. Short in the light. It's a little now. This one should last for about 15. Now we're doing the making of. Uh oh, there you're going to be. Making oh, of. Okay. Uh. Well, first off, why don't you give us a rundown of all your injuries from head to toe? You ain't got enough time. Really? No. Yeah. No, I just had some major places that hurt. Uh, let me look back here. I got uh, my neck area, which I hurt in the, in the car accident in 1983 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I've got a uh, bad right shoulder, horrible right shoulder. And uh, I tore a rotator cuff. I got a, like a half-inch tear there that been putting all surgery on for a while uh, since since I left Atlanta in 1990 which it was a um, everybody had their opinion on the reason why I left so I said I was hurt and, and they had other explanations for me but I was and I just haven't been able to uh, have the surgery done because I've been wrestling and I thought didn't think that's what I wanted to do at the time so it's my shoulder and my neck area uh, my back of course he up and the light went out again I don't know if that matters are you kidding Oh, okay. there came on. So there's just some kind of pressure there. Okay. So I think it's okay if she, if she's, maybe if you keep pushing it on the batteries. Just wonder if I might have burned out the line. Well, we did. We're cool. We're doing the making of again. <laughs> well, I'll make it easier. This time. Let me thank Dr. Pepper for sponsoring this. Diet. See, if it goes out, I'm just going to move we got that back. So we're back on. Okay. We're back on track. Okay. <laughs> okay. My neck area, my shoulder area, and the light went out again. This interview is not meant to be. So everything's happening. Here. It's looking over at the Just in case you're all. The light came on again. That's so right. Forget it. Forget it. Came. And he got the other like, shade on, so we might be able to see him better. I'm off. Yeah, we're we're fine. Okay. All right. We finished the injury list. <laughs> Nick. Shoulder with a rotator cuff, and uh, my elbows are bad, and, and uh, my back's really bad. But I just don't know. I don't my hip. I got a real bad hip. hip. A hip that I broke, first broke in 1983 in a match with David Schultz on WWF TV. No one would ever. No one's like slammed me outside on the floor at six man tag. Me and SD Jones and Tony Greer against David Schultz, Paul Orndorff, and uh, Roddy Piper. So actually, the upper part of my back starting at the hip up. I'm kind of done for. Okay. Have you been told you're going to have to do it? Undergo any surgery or anything? Yeah, the right the shoulder. And also in my neck, uh, the C5 vertebrae was like really cracked and chipped real bad. I still got a uh, place in there and where the disc and everything is, and it's, it's cracked off. And I gotta go, they got to go in. They say I go in from the front. They told me this in 83 after the car and to take it out. And it's, it's back here. And then I got to get the rotator cuff. Uh, men did it fixed whenever I know that I'm going to be wrestling anymore for a while. 
So yes, yes, I do, but I have put it off for a long time. And uh, but yes, okay, I do have that sort of probably on my head, my brain. Uh, <laughs> Everyone what? there's a green. Yes. I mean, you broke you broke your neck. When was that? In 1983, car accident. That was in a car accident. Downtown Pennsylvania, thrown right on the back of a truck. And, and were you going or coming from a taping? Yeah, I was going from a taping. I went, I went, we did a taping in downtown Pennsylvania, and if you were real good, I guess for the month, whatever, you got invited to a dinner afterwards at Vince McMahon's house, or not house, but this hotel in Reading, Pennsylvania, right up the road from it. And uh, so Arnold Stolen came to Kurt Henning and told Kurt to, for me and Kurt to come to the dinner. And uh, Kurt went on without me. And I took Jimmy Snooker from TV that I let him out of his room, went to my room, got showered, dressed, started driving to Reading. It was already like 12 o'clock, so I turned around to come back. I was tired, and really the next thing I know, and the only thing I remember is I woke up uh, in the hospital of Don Morocco over, and I had run under the back of a truck. And that same night, when they had me in the emergency room, uh, I, I remember the trauma unit uh, uh, buzzer going off or whatever, and, and all the nurses leaving me, and they said they got to go to my friend, and I didn't know who my friend was. And like three days later, my mom and dad, after they got to Allentown, uh, told me that Jimmy Snook was a girlfriend had died that very same night and uh, like uh, two minutes like after they brought me in they brought her in that, that was the night when they arrested Snook outside the hotel that's right that's right wow no that, that's a different story now now, now they arrested Snook one time in New York uh, outside a hotel at Howard Johnson's uh, that that's the one when he's running around the blanket that's right yeah that's right that's exactly right <laughs> that's right like, it took nine cops and they had dogs there and he knocked them all down and everything it was, a, it was great great story it wasn't great it was a great story. I loved every minute. I was 21 having fun. So how, how much longer was it until um, t- until they pulled the angle, until Vince pulled the angle? Which angle? On, on WWF. With the neck? Yeah. So what you're yeah. saying? Okay. With Mass Superstar? Yeah. Okay. Well, then, well what, so report, what I haven't seen that video in a long time, but didn't they claim you injured it against the Mass Superstar? Re-injured. Well, what it was, I wasn't really ready to come back to work. And... Uh, or I was going, I wanted, yeah, I was going to Japan, and they asked me to come on back to do the TV taping early, and I didn't know what they had in mind. And Jay Strongball, I guess, was his idea, and he called me off before TV and said, "We got this thing we want to do with you and uh, Mass Superstar," and I thought it was great, and I loved every minute of it, loved doing it. But uh, it was after they saw that I was okay, though. They didn't just try to get me to come and do it, you know, yeah, because of my feelings or anything. And then I went to Japan and I heard it in a match over there. Again, I wasn't ready to come back. I was going to come back too soon. And uh, I had been playing softball all summer at home, but, and thinking that I was getting back in shape to wrestle, but I just had to be bump shit on it, and I was hurt. And uh, I shouldn't really come back when I did, but I did. And I came back for a little while, stayed through the beginning of 1984, and that's when I got really homesick and wanted to come back to Memphis. And how long were you in Japan? Well, I was supposed to be there a month, but I only stayed like a week and a half or something. Like that. Who did you wrestle? Did you wrestle with Tiger Mask over there? Like no, I, I wrestled Tiger Mask in the WWF uh, in the latter part of 82. When he came over and he traveled with me and had a lot of fun with him and uh, stuff, I remember practicing his elbows in our rooms when we stayed together. He put pillows on top of beds like we have here in this room right now. And he dropped elbows on. I just watch him run and jump on the bed and do elbows and everything. He was a great guy and he's the nicest. And I got to have a lot of good matches with him. And one I still have on tape from the Spectrum in Philadelphia at home. But, uh, I really enjoy watching back and forth and remember how it looked 10 years ago. <laughs> Maybe 12, now 82, yeah. So, um, who, from, who, from whom did you learn to throw the fire? Watching a lot of ta- old tapes of the Sheik and, uh, of course, Lawler. I mean, watching Lawler throw it, but uh, the Sheik. I mean, I always, uh, I remember Saul Weingroff, an old manager uh, back in the 60s and everything you know, in, in Tennessee area that he threw the fire a lot. And it always just got me the fire. It was like, wow, that was the ultimate thing to do. And then Lawler started doing it, which increased it a little bit more. And I took it upon myself more out of and I finally got Lawler to go for the idea of letting me fire him so I can start using fire. Well, got him to go for a few ideas. Yeah, well, go, <laughs> go <laughs> He on. shouldn't have. Sorry, Gary. Go, going right to Lawler, um, Ooh. one of the things we're gonna, I'm going to drop in is we're getting that luncheon you did for um, Goodheart. Goodheart, where I guess you he's kind of pissed off Lawler. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's been your relationship with Lawler? I mean, how did what, what what was it like when it started, and how has it progressed or regressed through the years? Because you're intertwined with him for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's I think probably the best describes a love hate relationship. You know, either we're we're really working.
working together and having fun or we're just apart and uh, you know we you know I'm in another area or somewhere like West Philadelphia and we don't talk much or something like that so uh, but when we're together and really working together it's, it's great uh, it's fun to sit and talk to someone like that especially someone you look up to and someone like you idolized as a kid okay I've said it and and, uh, and I had to yeah let's get that on record and uh, it is and and uh, but I, I want to say this though about him too. Uh, I mean, the real idol of my life was my dad. I mean, I really looked up to him. I mean, he was he was the guy that I remember first breaking into wrestling. And, and Jerry Lawler came on as a as a thing at home to where I remember going to school and the kids always had that Lawler look on their face like they're going to be chewing their gum and saying, "I'm Jerry Lawler, the king." And so, you know, like I was sixth, seventh grade, I said, "Yeah, I want to. I'll be the king someday." I walk around school and I'm doing the book and I'm doing the strut and everything. And, Thing, yeah, sure will. And so I got I started in with the Tommy Gilbert type of um, kind of being shy type thing in wrestling, but I always thought I just needed to be the bad guy. So I wanted to be like Lawler. As soon as I got a chance to be the bad guy, to be the heel, I just took up doing Lawler and uh, and Terry Funk and a few others I look up to too. And and, uh, and my dad. So in my style, sometimes you'll see a Jerry Lawler, a Tommy Gilbert, a Terry Funk, a Jack Briscoe, or. Uh, Heck, even I remember watching Luke Fez when I was a kid because he was just in his 60s or something in that. He's just whatever, 106, I don't know. But, <laughs> but whatever he is, he's still living. Way to go, Luke. And um, <laughs> I don't mean that bad. But, but you know, form stuff. I learned the old style, the new style. And uh, with Jerry Lawler, I just want to make sure that I say that. The first off, he was the black and white hero. He, his picture did, was on my wall when I was a kid. But on, on the sidewalk, I don't see it. Now you're doing the, you're doing the book right now on the US, USWA, right? Doing what? You're you're writing a book right now on the USWA, right? Well, I, I, I'd say that I said it, you know I, I have a good good love uh, uh, picture of what's going on right now. Yeah. So that must mean Lawler's got a lot of respect for you. Yeah, I think. Well, I don't think there's any disrespect for e either one of us, but I think after a while, like uh, uh, you know, I mean, heck, I mean, we all feel threatened. And after a while, I would think that, you know, I mean, um, uh, in this area, we had Jackie Fargo for years and years and years. And um, Jerry Lawler was his protege. And Jerry, he trained Jerry Lawler to wrestle. And uh, Fargo was the man in the 60s when I was growing up and, and until the middle 70s. And Lawler took over. And uh, Fargo really didn't want to leave or let go either, but he finally had to. And so uh, I, I think Jerry Lawler, is, is, uh, he's had his great, great time in, in the wrestling business, had fun. He's done everything, won every championship. He's drawn more sellouts at the Mid-South Coliseum than Elvis Presley. But sooner or later, there comes a time for change. And I think that is where there's a, you know, some kind of a problem sometimes with us, is that if he feels that the people are ever you know, getting a little bit too far to Eddie's side or... or or over that line, then he wants to pull back, and uh, we have a problem. But other than that, everything is cool. So there's no disrespect. No. And how does he feel about you running for uh, office right now? We haven't discussed that too much. We, we, uh, I really haven't discussed it too much with anybody in wrestling business, and um, because first of all, I don't think they want to talk to me about it, and because um, they don't understand what it's about. So, um, what, what, what are you running for first? I run for county court clerk, for the county clerk they call it this year. Not really, and. So that's a full time uh, position, right? Yeah. And what county are you? Henderson County. Lexington. What are you, what are your duties gonna be? I get to marry people. That's one of my Well but <laughs> I thought if I got to if I got to talk to them too much they probably would back out and not get married if I would explain to them a few things. But I, I think I think that uh, no, the job really carries it does. I, I mean really that is the true that's a shoot there. I'm gonna tell the truth on that part. I would be able to marry somebody if they came to me and said any we want to get married. So anyone out there, if I were to get this, you come on down, I'll marry you up. You know, we'll have that weekend deal, you know, one prize take off. Yeah, you'll, you'll bring up the That's right. Yeah. Yep. You'll find me, Norman Bates. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, it's license tags. They, people will come to me get their license tags and, and they'll pay the wheel tags and everything. But uh, uh, but that's what it is. That's, that's what the capacity job is. But I hope someday to be state representative. That oh, so you, so you have higher aspirations? Yes, I do, but I think just like in wrestling, you have to start somewhere. And, you know, I wanted to be Booker when I got in wrestling. I knew it was 17, and uh, no one was going to listen to me, so I had to wait till I was 25, which was that uh, I was still one of the youngest to ever get a chance, so I was happy with that. Wrestling is so big around here that you were running for office in this area, even though they all know you're a wrestler, doesn't uh, really get in the way of your running, does it? 
Well, I don't know. It's the first time uh, something like this here. These people there, they're not uh, used to a lot of them. I'm sure at home right now, are probably saying, uh, "Want to stay wrestling? He's doing fine right now. Why does he want to get out?" That's the that's the number one question right now. Why do I want to get out? And uh, they didn't expect it this soon and, and and stuff like that. But uh, I don't think he would understand that. So. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's go to. I'll watch a lot of seats, man. You know, that. Okay, well, a lot of people have asked me to ask you about the uh, split up of the new fans back in 84. Yeah. The, the Tommy Rich angle. You, uh, you did an angle in the studio where the uh, wrestling fan convention, I think, was the. Yeah, we got the trophies and that stuff. Sorry, Tommy, to come back, please. I love you. <laughs> Yeah, and then he attacked you, right? No. Well, he, he attacked me first, and I suckered him in by interview with saying I was really sorry and and that uh, I didn't mean it, and please you, accept my... But you were, no, you were bleeding a gush. I was bleeding, yes, and wiping wipe my head, Lance Russell standing there, and Lance didn't believe me at first, and then he winds up saying, ah, oh, I guess it takes a big man to admit when he's wrong, Eddie. And I was wrong, I said. <laughs> and then Tommy, uh, well, and that was one of the first angles that I ever got done. That was my idea to use the uh, trophies from the... Uh, Convention. See that way, we got the trophies as the tag team of the year. Plus, I got the him over the head with So I got two things in there at once. Uh, two ideas done. That was fun. <laughs> Sucker and the people. Yeah, and then he introduced the hell out of him. And then how long did that you go on? Uh, I think about it was like four weeks, five weeks, something like that. And, and then I talked to the man, the, to, uh, the international belt Tommy had, and I talked to him into that. So somehow in there, and then I took the international belt. And about eight months, so uh, um, just slowly. There was King Kong Bundy here and Rick Rude, and then I was like the third from the top as far as the heel side. And I had my little international belt, and I was wrestling Randy Savage and Lanny Popo, and um, just trying to think of a couple others that threw in there. Terry Taylor came in for a little bit, and I wrestled him, and 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 so that was an eight month there. And then, then a strange thing happened. I don't know what your next question is, but please come with it if, if you. What was the strange Because I'm just running, I'm running in here, so thinking things that ran into each other. There, so got four hours of tag team. Okay, what happened? Look, what happened there is that this was like my eight eight months of, of being the international champion, and Lawler had been doing his top program with like Rick Rude and King Kong Bundy, and then Rick Rude, uh, Bundy left, and then he was Rude, and all of a sudden I got the notch up, and I was going, wow, process elimination, and we lost. Well, it's not like me there. Jimmy Hart was my manager, and I was real happy, and I'm like, yeah, I went home and getting to be a heel and. Can do everything, but I still haven't got that atten- Lawler's attention yet to want to work the program with me. And then uh, Rick Rude up and left for some reason, and so we went to uh, it was Nashville, Tennessee on a Saturday night, and Rude was gone. And so they sent word over to us for all of us to go out to the ring, uh, all the heels, uh, about seven of us I think on that side. And the way that they did everything, the interns were together, tag team, mass tag team. Roger Smith was one of them, and Eddie Marlin went to him and said. I want y'all to look like you're passing something out, you know, back and forth out there so the people will boo y'all, and we're going to have the people pick the person they hate the most to wrestle Lawler for the title in Nashville. And so we sat over there, and I didn't really think anything about it. And we got out there, and they did all their stuff and everything, and the people still picked me. And I got to wrestle Lawler that night, and he listened to the people, and then we they did that in each city, and each city the people picked me. And then on the interviews I started saying that uh, – uh, that I was the next king and this and this and this and all of a sudden that started a lot. How, how long did that go on until your next stop? For, for us, when I started with Lawler? Yeah. It, it ended 84, started in 85, and then uh, Tom Ernesto came in as Booker, and then I took off to uh, to Mid-South, what later became UWF, about yeah. March of 85, April 85, somewhere. Well, I mean, what was your first big angle in Mid-South? There was that turnaround with... The Russians, or I can't even remember that. That was, yeah, well, she just brought the picture, the, the portrait, the portrait thing I did was the first thing that I ever did as a heel to, to bring anything to it. But I did when I first got there. I don't, you know, in Memphis, I, as a heel, I got real comfortable with, with the fact that I was the top heel in Memphis. And you just have that feeling when you walk out that the people hate you. And when you go somewhere new, you really got to work when they don't know who you are to get that over. And all of a sudden, I went to, to uh, Mid South and, uh, Bill Dundee was booking, and he wanted me to do the general, Eddie Gilbert, that I'd done here, that Lawler had done, and uh, manage a guy named The Nightmare, which is Randy Colley. 
and he became the North American champion. I was managing him. But I didn't really feel good in that role or anything, and then I wound up being a baby face for a little while and really not really finding what my character was. And then uh, Jake Roberts is the one that had the idea. Jake Roberts had the idea that uh, all of a sudden I turn on the Fantastics and I get this portrait made of myself, but it was a rib on me is what it was because Jake said, get it done, and uh, whatever it costs, give the... the receipt to Bill Watts and he'll reimburse you and it was $495 I think at the time and I remember turning in and Bill laughed at me like three straight weeks to get it back to me so I had to go in for $500. So Jake really didn't know whether the thing would get over or not he just did it really riveted me and it did get over. I went on TV every week and said um, you know the people writing letters and tell me why they want the portrait of myself and, and, and it worked. All of a sudden I had this new character and from there on I got to go on and that was the first deal had a little run there as the Mid-South Tag Champions with the Nightmare at the end together. And then a little bit later, um, I announced my retirement that I was going to uh, start managing a Russian uh, named Porchinko and the Blade Runner Sting and Rock or Ultimate Warrior, whoever. And we had some interesting trips. And then Rick Steiner came in about the same time too, but he was for a second match. And I still haven't got a hold of him yet as far as molding him. And, talking to him and everything and then we got with the Russian Korchenko they brought Ivan Kolov and uh, and Nikita in and I think Bill Watts had done something to me the week before or had done something to the you know to the Russian or something like that because I had this idea and this was another one I, I, I enjoy when I'm able to get these because this was a this was an idea but it, it, it got Bill Watts to thinking that I could uh, come up with some good ideas or angles or something so I came up with a thing where I go down to the ring and uh, I would go dressed really just uh, subtle because I was always wearing uh, outrageous looking pants and crazy teeny shoes, kind of like Jimmy Hart, crazy sunglasses and, and running out there and acting a fool. So I wore like you know, a pair of sweatpants and teeny shoes, walked out to the ring and said, I want to call a great man out here. And, uh, Bill Watts came down and uh, I said, you're really a great man and I want to tell you that you know, I'm, I'm sorry for everything I've done. You're right. I'm this. I'm done, you know, whatever he called me, an idiot, and I am that. And I just want to shake your hand. And he said, all right. He shook my hand about that time. Um, all the Russians came in from behind, and, and uh, uh, the Blade Runners come up the aisle, and they held Bill Watts, and I took this red painted shovel, and I blasted him over the head with it, and he was bleeding, and I slapped him, and we... I laid the uh, Russian flag over his face, and that started my first major. I mean, it'd been like doing the, the main event type angle with Lawler here. I did with Bill Watts there, and then I got to do some matches where if he won, he got five minutes with me alone. And I got to wrestle him for the whole five minutes, which was fun. Uh, and also, uh, he whipped me. I let him whip me with a belt a few nights, too. Uh, but I showed him I'd take it. I was sort of, I was man enough. I took like four or five good licks with it before I jump out of the ring and run. Most guys would take one or two, then leave. But, uh, I tried to show him I was man enough to do it, and but I got a lot of my ideas across to him that way, and that was the main the angles, I guess, and to lead up to stuff. And how how long did you last in this house? <clears throat> From 1985 through the buyout, through the buyout of Crockett, buying it out um, to the early part of '88, '85 to '88, I guess. You but that, like I said, it was the UWF to start. Yeah. Miss out the UWF to NWA UWF. So. What were some of the other major angles that you were running in during those years? I'm going to drop in. I got a, I got a first generation on the on the turn turn with the Russians, so I'm going to drop that in there. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Where did Missy come in? The 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 Missy deal was uh boy I get a little fishy on this one because uh it turned out it was like uh, what, by the way I'm a divorce attorney so you're okay okay but it was no <laughs> this was funny this I mean this whole this whole angle this whole idea was actually really what was going on and, and that's what the, it was I mean this when you see any of this tape of stuff of, of what happened then it was I mean it was real it was did going on John? it was going on behind the scenes did she get John with the bag with that room well, I just don't want this on tape right here for you know, I don't <laughs> stay that for later yeah I just let me just talk like right now. Oh. that was great but, but when, you, when you're when you looking at the things and looking at people's faces and when we get in the ring and, and any time Taylor, it always, you know, I'm glad in the end it always got to me that we, we were able to do so much stuff with each other and still somehow uh, work in the same place on the same route because there was very tense moments a lot of people don't know about. Um, 
at big arena shows like Houston. I remember one night a big thing happening. Uh, uh, Sting was wrestling Tatum and Missy was at ringside. I think uh, uh, something happened. Uh, I was down. I, I had separate dressing room away from John and those guys, and actually I was away from everybody. Uh, kind of like alienated uh, with her. And uh, I didn't get to see what happened because I was at the back, and somehow or another he whacked her pretty good or something. And it was during the start of it. And, and then she gets back. I mean, this kind of stuff went on. And, and so the stories never got to be told. But but in the end, uh, of, of me and Missy, when we first met, was uh, just like, I don't know, I tried to stay away from her when I first saw her. I didn't really want to be around her. And then I, from what I could tell, it was about the same. And, and we finally. Uh, I, I kind of just wandered into her room one night in Tulsa, Oklahoma after the matches. After, you ever see the tape where Sting and I won the UWF tag belts from the Fantastic where Missy hits Tommy Rogers with the purse and John Tatum with her? Well, that night was our first meeting after the matches. We, I was at the La Quinta in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I just kind of went out. And Missy opened up her door, and there she was, and I just kind of walked in, and we got to talk, and then one thing led another, and a few weeks later we were together. And, a lot of tense moments. So, but that was uh, one of my favorite angles because it was a true life thing going on, on television, life in, imitating art, art imitating life, and it was, it was a real thing. And then the greatest thing of all was being able to come back and to Global a couple of years ago or a year ago and, and uh, be able to see John Taylor and work with him and I almost feel in a funny way that we were some kind of like man. We both you both been through the exactly yeah so, both been on the same ride yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I had four good years, and uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, regret anything. So. Well, now, you met Missy, when was that? About 80? 86 is when I met Missy. So you were there for yeah. co- almost a couple couple of years with her, so it must have been tense a lot of nights. Oh, anytime you're with Missy, that's what you mean. It's tense. It's <laughs> real tense. You, you don't know, you know, unless you're in public sometimes. Uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of weird things. Uh, John Gillum, my good friend, sitting over here at the other end of the room, so he, he can understand what I'm saying here, too, and, and anybody that knows, that was with me and Missy much in public, you know, so I'm kind of when I go in somewhere, I like to have a ball cap on and a pair of glasses and, and, my, and my coat turned up, and I just want to go eat and, and not be bothered by anybody about anything. I'm just kind of secretive and quiet and just won't be bothered period, and, and she wants to walk in with the black sunglasses on and the hair is back and blonde showing everywhere and it's like a Hollywood starlet came in to the restaurant or, or store or, or, or airport or something and it's not a, it's not a fun thing for me and, and plus when she threw tantrums and which went on a lot you know in public you know behind the scenes I don't care it's, it's fun in public so it was tense a lot of times I remember my dad looked at me and said mm, good luck and, it, and your dad was shaking his head. I have, I'll tell you, i got to say this, too, and I, because I'm sure my family will see it. And uh, it was tense on them, too, in the beginning of it because I put them through a lot of stuff. It was, my dad put me through a thing one time with choosing him or you know, my family or Missy, so but they, they wound up, uh, everything worked out. Everything worked out. It was tense time. That's been driving you nuts. Did it affect your work? I don't think so. I think it made me better. I think that's what probably made me uh, decide and know that I work better under pressure than I do when I got a lot of time to think. So uh, um, I, I really, I, because if you think about it, in, in 87, uh, we got married in October of 87. In March of 87 is when I got offered a booking job at Watts, and I was going through all this. And Watts uh, knew it and called me in and, and asked me if I take the job and if I take as much power in the dressing room as, as Ken Mantell. And I said, yes, sir, that's what I've been waiting for. And he gave it to me. And, um, uh, I mean, I was still uh, going through some stuff in personal life, but I was always able to, you know, keep that separate. And I, I've always tried to do that. If I can. And so where was the relationship when you, when the UWF sold out? Where was the relationship? I mean, where, you, where did you go and, where, and what was the relationship? Oh, okay. When UWF sold out, Missy had actually, well, man, it was good. At, at the you, time. You can see the TV movie in, in years to come. Yeah. It's just, boy, I th- it's funny because when I got ready to leave, uh, when I got, re- I got ready to leave the UWF because I thought Ken Mantell and, and, uh, and have all respect in the wor- world for Michael Hayes, and we became friends um, a couple of years after all this because Michael Hayes is first cousin John Tatum. and you know, there were sides picked in this thing, but there was never anything said publicly. We never, there was always that respect between us that we never ever got any kind of argument or anything like that. And 
So, but I always felt there were sides, and, and I wanted to get out while I could. And, and all of a sudden, one day in Baton Rouge, uh, Vince McMahon called uh, while I was outside taking the garbage out of the dumpster. I'll never forget this. I was coming back through, and Missy says, uh, Vince McMahon's on the phone. He wants to talk to you. So I took the phone, and he flew us up uh, two days later to talk to us. Uh, I was going to get through a hot seat thing like Piper did. That was the deal with me. And Missy was, got her tryout that she did. Uh, that's at the same time as what was going on there. So she went to work like for a month or something for him. Um, so I gave my notice on a Saturday morning uh, in Memphis. We worked Memphis on a Friday night. I flew, excuse me, that's the story. Right. I flew in from meeting with Vince Man on Friday. Decided I wanted to get fired on Friday night from UWF because I was under contract. So I thought I'd do everything in the world I could that night to get fired. So I'd go to work for Vince. So, uh, what did you do? I took my no. I didn't really. I guess uh, first, uh, I don't even know what the finish. I don't even remember what the finish was who I was working with. But I told Kim Mantel I didn't want to do it, and he had to do it my way. And he did it. That's what killed me. Everything got changed from my my way last that night. I was like, oh no. So my brother Doug, who was uh, playing uh, football then, it's his senior year though. I had him come to ring with me in Memphis because people knew him. And I, I thought well, I'll introduce Doug, and surely Ken's will get mad about this, and he'll fire me when I get to the back. I got to the back, and they said, good idea. You know, and I was thinking, oh, my gosh, what do you do to get fired here? So so I left that night, and me and Missy talked, and we went to uh, the USWA TV tape the next morning. I wanted to see Lawler and see everybody and say hello. And so we went in, and I decided uh, that I was just going to call Bill Watts from the, the WMC TV studios. Now, I'm working for the UWL. <laughs> I've got Vince up here who's then told me all this, and I'm like, yeah, boy. And this is all I've ever wanted. I'm thinking things are finally falling in place here. Call Bill Watts. Bill, this is Eddie. I tell you, I'm just kind of, you know, um, I'm not happy anymore. It's okay. I like to get out of my contract, which he was very hard about that, that contract deal. He had you. He wasn't letting you go just about. I mean, well, now he had lost like, people already, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and but they had to niggle out before there was really contracts. When the UWF was formed, there, that's when the contracts came in big time. One man gang can tell you about this. And uh, because he, he kept him like uh, eight months more than he should. Gang wanted to go to events and everything, and, and he couldn't. And, uh, let me see. John, what are you doing over here? Put that out. Uh, <laughs> all right. And so I, when I called Bill, told him I want to get out of the thing, and he says, okay, uh, you know what, Eddie, I sure was saying about giving you a shot at booking here. And I was like, the only thing in the world this guy could say that's going to keep me is booking. Because this is, I mean, this is, I started in 79, this was 85, six years later, I'm ahead of schedule, is what I'm figuring. Wow. You know, we're on national syndicated TV. This was not Memphis. This is Bill Watson talking to. And I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, uh, when? <laughs> so, and then he started telling me the whole thing. He said, matter of fact, I want you to book the next Memphis card. I thought, man, all right. I know exactly what Memphis wants. So I did the Memphis card, told Missy. So the deal was made that I would stay and be Booker if Missy could get out of her contract and go to WWL. She got out. She went. I stayed. Uh, then the buyout came right after that. And then Missy... Uh, stayed, came back after the buyout and went back to work for Crockett and with Dusty Book and, and I was uh, naive enough to think in my first meetings with Dusty that they were going to make it to UWL versus the NWA but I soon found out uh, if you remember some of Rick Flair's interviews back then he was shooting totally uh, so was Dusty if you ever say Nikita uh, when they talk about the TV belt and I said something on TBS one time about uh, the NWA had its greatest legends or something like that, but the UWF was the new generation or something like that. Of, and Flair just went off when he went on his interview, and, and I could tell I got to him. And it was real a lot of friction there, tension between the UWF guys and the NWA. All of a sudden, I saw I used to be able to book my own cards for the UWF, even with the buyout. And then Dusty started faxing me the cards for uh, the UWF to use, and I knew then it was a demise. And I finally got out in December of 87 and came back and I came back to Memphis in about January of 88 and uh, that's where we did the fire angle with Lawler where I came into the ring uh, Lawler was wrestling Tommy Rich and my brother Doug hit the ring and uh, I wasn't scheduled to be there at night I came in my clothes on and threw the big fireball in Lawler's face and that's when I talked to him about going for the fire got started doing the fire for the deal. so we came to Memphis say three months got a call from Alabama and they said that they were new owner wanted to change everything and so they called me and I said, yes, I'll go. 
and I went down there and booked for six months. Well, now, what happened to the relationship when she's, she's working for Dusty and you're up in Memphis for three months? Oh, she came with me. Oh, she came with you. Yeah, yeah she, her loyalty was there. She, she was with me through thick and thin during those times, so. Okay, then you go to. Uh, she okay. came to Memphis and was just a valet, Missy Hyatt with me. I mean, you know, she went from that. Uh, star status of being with WCW, WWF to Memphis. She was okay, went to Alabama. Uh, I made her commentator there with uh, Charlie Platt on, on the show. And uh, uh, that way she, she was doing her job and that way I was involved in the wrestling part. And I was able to book and, and everything. I liked Alabama too. I had good memories of Alabama. Who brought you down there? Um, Jack Curtis brought me down there. And he was from the OUWF uh, uh, crew there, I guess you'd say. So. He was uh, Bill Watts had told him to call me about come in, and, and I was real happy about that too. And it worked; that we were successful. Uh, what was great was is that UWF when I took over, and I didn't know it, you know, at the time. And that's what was funny, and I've said this a lot of different times. But the most time that I was successful, I didn't really know I was. UWF, whenever we went on our first national tour, um, I remember Amarillo, Texas, was pulling up there, and there were cars all over the front. I said, "It's got to be something else." And we got inside Terry Taylor, who was probably my best friend then. He was the best man in my wedding with Missy. And, and it took him and Missy telling me that, that uh, we were successful, the gates were good, and that the TV was turned around. We were drawing people in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Then the buyout came, which just totally got me. I thought, man. And then the thing with Dusty and the head games got me. I was getting really disinterested in the business or, or that those kind of games. And came to Memphis, the fire angle worked. We saw Memphis jumped back up again. So I was going into Alabama on a good high changed everything there, changed it from being, um, uh, I think it was, it was Continental Championship Wrestling, CCW or something like that, and we changed it to CWF, Continental Wrestling Federation, so it would be more into, uh, like the UWF was, and the WWF with the Elf there, Federation, uh, took all three belts, made one out of it, one area champion, oh, I, that's what I worked the whole time I was there towards, was to have one champion, I had all the singles belts turn in, and uh, worked to a big tournament, the Road to Birmingham is what we called it, the whole time I was there. And we worked up there. I never made it to the Road to Birmingham. Um, got right up there, but never made it to the finished product of my booking there because of the owner. And I had this little uh, bit of real few things. So that was uh, the element. How long was the run there? Six months. And that's where you were first with Paul Dick. Paulie, yeah, Paulie, I, I knew that uh, Paulie had, had uh, I'd seen Paulie's stuff, and I really enjoyed it. I remember Paulie, see, Paul was a photographer, did interviews with me when he was like 13, when I was in WWF, when I was wrestling. I remember Paul from there, Paul Heyman, I remember being a photographer, and that, uh, uh, I saw him a lot when I was up there at the matches, and talked to him, and then he didn't, he didn't know that whenever he got to the business, whenever he became Paulie Dangerous, I didn't even remember who he was, and I saw him in Atlanta. Uh, here in 88, I came down to do a tape for Tommy Rich in Atlanta for, I think, for Blackwell then when he had his group going. And uh, Paul was there managing, and, I, and he came up to me shake hands, and he was going to say, Paul, like that. And I said, I know who you are. You don't have to tell me. I, I remember you. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. And I told him I liked his stuff. And um, so he said, any time that I, you know, I had a booking job or if I ever wanted to bring him anywhere, please give him a call. And whenever I got to Alabama, I knew it needed a manager, uh, a good one. And Paul was the kind of guy that could draw Southern heat real good. And Paul was the kind of guy that could draw all kinds of heat from everybody. So, and but he's a good. Uh, I think he's a great talent for a business. And, and we had a good run there. And he helped me. I had Paul. That's when I, I took Doug. Doug and Paul were my two. I guess you'd say assistants. Because uh, I was to, both of them. I was. I wanted to teach anything that I had learned since I was even like 12 years old. I want to try to let you know other people know about because I figured it's the best. Everybody right now is worried about steroids and, 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 and uh, uh, sex scandals in the WWF. And I think we all should be you know, worried about a, the 500 channel super highway, you know, how many wrestling channels we're going to have. So uh, that's the things we got to be thinking about now. So that stuff. So, uh, now you and Paul ran an angle with John here, didn't you? With who? Did you, did you use John's name? I use John a lot. John, John, I use John a lot. John, come here. Say, you gotta be seen. Come here. Come here. Come here. Just come here. Let me. Let people see you. They may on a tape. They'll see you. They'll see you. Come here. Just say hello to everybody. Come here. This is this is my friend John. John, say hello. Hello. Okay, that's enough. Go ahead. <laughs> see now, if you do this back, you have slow motion on your video machine. There, you can slow it down. See John longer. 
But didn't you do it? Free on pause. I did a few angles with John I'd like to tell you about. And if you give John three beers, he'll tell you all of them. What about the one where, let me see, uh, you offered 10000 to anybody in the audience? That's right. That was the first one. Yeah, tell us about that. That was the first one. That was, uh, oh, man, these, these Alabamas was, was the best old John. Uh, John, you can go back to that. Just, you understand that. Yes, <laughs> has bad arthritis, too. You know, I'll agree with Oh, oh yeah. top role. <laughs> He's been... So, so we used to go down. We did a thing uh, where I'd go down and say ten thousand dollars to anybody, any wrestler or wrestling fan that could beat me. It's kind of like the Andy Kaufman deal with the women, but I'd seen this deal done when I was a kid with, uh, like I was a junior or senior in high school, with Adrian Adonis doing the ten thousand dollar golden challenge in the Amarillo area. I mean, any of you guys want to look back at that and see what I'm talking about? So I remember that and used that in Alabama because we had no belt to put up so I took money and put it up so I had six months building for the big belt thing and then six months to use money as to put up instead of a belt so I'd go down and I would pick and man you know every week there you know, you'd see these, these these old farmers sending these big old boys horses like horse cart right in the crowd and women look like horse cart right in the crowd and <laughs> look real ugly women but big ones they didn't want to fight me and get in the ring. And so one week what we did was have John Gillum sit in the front row with this farmer's looking shirt on. Kind of like he really wears it. And uh, his ball cap and his glasses and everything. And he said a pair of jeans and boots on, I think it was. I think he had a t-shirt on. Didn't he? So, uh, I'm trying to remember everything. So Paul says, anybody in the crowd, everybody stands up. Oh, this is on TV. We have this on tape. Don't have it. It's good. But... We're sitting there, we're looking around the crowd, and then we got the camera panning. There's this big man, there's these big women, they all want to get in the ring. And all of a sudden, we pick John Gillum, but we don't know what's John Gillum. We pick John. And uh, John comes in the ring, and uh, he's in his uh, jeans and, and boots and his ball cap. And so Paul calls him over to me, and Paul does the whole deal, though, because I couldn't hold a straight face just about it, because I was sitting there looking at John, going, oh man, if he makes us do this, it'll be great. So Paul says, What's your name? And he says, John Gillum. And. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good, and and Paul had John look in the camera and do a disclaimer that it was okay for do this ten thousand dollar gold challenge if he gets hurt. He took John's cigarettes out of his pocket, and I saw John get mad. I thought he John was going to deck him there, and threw his cigarettes out to the front row. John had no idea his cigarettes were going, and um, so we uh, I think he took his shirt off. I think it's I think so. Where I either pulled it off of him or something, but I beat the hell out of him. And he, he, I, I gave him a pile driver. Yeah, I gave him a pile driver, and then after, when he was down, he's shaking from the pile driver. I go, and if you look at this thing, it's, it's good. I go, I go down to grab his pants, and I think he thought, here Eddie is going to pull this big rib on me in the business. Now he's going to pull my pants off on TV, which now looking back at it, I wish I had because it'd been <laughs> easy to do. But I reached down to get his belt to pull it off to whip him. Because I thought, here's something to do, and I'm going to get him good because he can't do anything about it. So <laughs> I reached down to go get his belt, and he clamped on my hand. He goes, no, no, don't do it, don't do it. I said, give me your belt. I'm not going to take your pants off. And he lets go, and I got his belt off, and I whipped him good, too. He had about four good red legs on there. And then Austin Idol comes down to the ring and saves him. And the good part about it was that at the end of the deal, they're carrying John back on the, on the stretcher, and Somebody takes the cigarettes and puts them back on his chest from the crowd. So he got his cigarettes back, and he was happy. But the greatest story of all, of anything we've done with John, is something that's not on film, it's not on tape, and no one has. Like, three weeks later, this is a good story. Three weeks later, since John, uh, we've already seen John, but we put this back in again, how John looked. And you can remember this and, and, and see that we had this match between Jerry Law and Austin Island in Dalton, Alabama. I had done a thing where I beat up Pez Wiley, who was Willie B. Hurt's son. I beat him up on TV for son. Beat the son. A fan came out of the crowd with a knife, actually, too, on that tape. You'll see him in Birmingham. He come out, and so me and Willie B. had a match. Austin Allen and Jerry Lawler had a match. We had a thing where Austin Allen got Jerry Lawler into a figure four leg lock. The referee's down. The people in Dalton know I hate Idol, but they also know the history because I'd shown it on tape of me and Lawler. So I come down to the ring, they don't know who I'm going to help. So I burned out. Lawler got the win. But when Lawler came up, of course, he helps Idol out like he didn't, he didn't mean for it to happen or anything. So then Idol was off the next week. So I put on the booking sheet for Dothan, me against Mr. Dothan. 
So all week long, especially Jerry Stubbs, who was Mr. Olympia or whatever he was there, he got, who, who, am I Mr. Dothan? You're just changing my name. Everybody wanted to know if they were Mr. Dothan. And on the interview, I said Bob Armstrong and Ron Fuller and Robert Fuller and Jerry Lawler may be coming back under the mask as Mr. Dothan, or it could be Austin Idol. And so all week long, the boys were asking me. Then it got to where towards the weekend, towards Saturday night, Missy got to ask me about it. Well, who are you going to put it on? I said, well, I got somebody in my I'm not going to tell you now. You won't believe it. You think I'm nuts. And uh, so then Doug came to me and like, Saturday afternoon, he said, by the way, who's Mr. Dothan? I said, I'll let you know that. It's a, a surprise. Then Paul, on the way to Dothan, says, hey, you haven't said a word about Mr. Dothan all week. You haven't said about it all day. Who is it? I don't even know. You're keeping me in the dark on the thing. It's okay enough for Missy, I see. I don't understand what Doug, but why, why keep me in the dark? So I told him, I said, you won't believe it when, when we do it, and I'll just wait till we get ready to do it because you're going to call me crazy. So... In the meantime, I already, already talked to someone though, when I get to, the, to what happened, so you understand that all this was actually set up in my mind, and I'd already taken care of a few things before this, and I didn't actually put my job on the line, like it looked like for about 10 minutes. So we get to the building, everybody's looking around, is anybody new in the building, in the dressing room, is anybody new there that we figure is going to wear a mask, be Mr. Dolphin, or someone come in with the mask on saying they're Mr. Dolphin? Now everyone's coming into my room in Dothan saying, okay, who is it? Don't, don't know. When we get to know, when we had to hit the ring, Doug's asking me, Paul's, I said, go get John Gill. And what I want you to they went, <laughs> and Paul, Paul, seriously, I mean, I think he asked Paul that now. He will tell you that, that I mean, he thought that night that you might as well just, just lock me up. I mean, I had just lost it. I mean, now I was, we had sold Dothan out. Now, i got to say this, too. We sold it out the week before. It was the first $10,000 it was like ten thousand eight hundred dollars, and we I'd taken it from doing twelve hundred dollars on a Saturday night to doing ten thousand dollars on a Saturday night. Great feeling. Come back the next week, we over, went over eleven with some Mr. Dolphin. Turn people away. We got John Gillum. Now I've got into the back, and everybody's looking at me. I miss he's even going, ah, you're nuts. You're crazy. You better not do this. These people will die if you do this. I said. Well, I'm not going to send him out there the way he is. I, won't, I, I, I sent Paul and Doug, and everybody went to Danny Davis and Ken Wayne, and we got, and I'm not sure, I think it's Ken Wayne's boots, Danny Davis's tights, Jerry Stubbs' his mask is Mr. Olympia. Uh, he wore a Austin Idol t-shirt, um, and he was covered, everything was covered. He had tight, but he had everybody else's on, but no one knew that in the crowd. So, you know, Mr. Olympia's mask and everything. This is a little trivia for everyone from that night. And so I went to the ring with Paul. Everybody's wondering. Now the boys, some of them still know, don't know. Some of them know, but most of them don't know. And when they, when they're hearing what it is, they're going, "No, he's, he's not going to send John out there like that." So me and Paul get in the ring, and all of a sudden they start this music, dun, 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 and all of a sudden here comes this mask guy walking to the ring. And 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 I remember, I remember this feeling in the crowd that just rumble like, "Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no," and then. And, and John was making noises to hear this pity pat. Now he's scratching his pants if you hear that too. So stop <laughs> what you're doing. <laughs> See, I know you. See, want to beat the hell out of him? So, so John comes walking down to the ring. He's got, he's got this mask on. He's looking at me. And he's coming down to the ring. Now, all the boys have stayed. A lot of them like leaving early. A lot of boys have come out to watch this match. And they're watching. And they're shaking their head going, he's lost it. He'll be gone tomorrow. He's going to get fired. He's going to kill this town tonight. He gets he gets into the ring, and I grab the mic, and I said, who are you and on the microphone? And this old man sitting behind me on the front row yells out, that's that same son of a bitch you knocked the hell out of three weeks ago here. And I was like, I started almost laughing because I thought, no one remember John Gillum from the $10,000 thing on TV. And sure enough, somebody remembered him right there. So I'm going, wow, this is great. It's even better than what I thought. So we went ahead and, and we locked up. We actually started the match. Now I've got everybody thinking this is the match. This is the main event. Mr. Dalton is John Gillum against me in the main event. And I backed myself in the corner. I said, John slapped the shit out of me. And John backs me into the corner. And Pee Wee Anderson, Randy Anderson was referee. And he got between us. And I'm telling Randy and everything. All of a sudden, John slaps the hell out of me. And I said, John, when I come running out of this corner, I want you to arm drag me. Okay, because me and John used to wrestle as kids. So John had knows how to do the arm drags and everything, lock up, no deal. So I come running out of the corner, he gives me an arm drag. After the slap, I took a bump, scooted out to the floor, fell on my rear end, 
Paul comes to me, and I look, and John Gillum's up in the ring with that mask on, and he's like doing Muhammad Ali around the ring, and the people are going nuts. They're standing up going crazy. And I'm thinking, my God, we have made John Gillum and Dothan. I remember the feeling going, oh, Lord, maybe, <laughs> I can't believe this. We've really made anybody now. So anyway, then, uh, then I remember the most panicking feeling I ever had, though, was when I was outside the ring, and I grabbed the microphone. I said, who is this guy? Is he a boxer or what? What is he? And John Gillum asked for the microphone, and I remember almost panicking, going, oh, no, God, he'll kill the place if they hear him talking here. And uh, so I remember yelling, no, no, put the microphone down. John did. I went back into the ring, jumped him, gave him, like, three pile drivers. I said, now I'm going to pull the mask off. Pull the mask off. Now the people feel like they just got screwed, paid their hard-earned money to see this. You know, and I'm just, we've taken advantage of them. All of a sudden, Austin Idol, who had been in the parking lot, in his car the whole time, none of the wrestlers knew he was there. Had the mask on, the patch, came to the ring, and he had this uh, axe handle that he called Bertha or something like that. He brought it into the ring and started whacking me with it, and I was bleeding from it. And then we let him take Paul Lee and, like, break his arm with it. And uh, the people loved it, went crazy. And and uh, and Dolphin stayed up from there, and I went back back home that night, and everybody couldn't believe it. That and John Gillum left the ring with Austin Idol. The people loved him. Uh, because Idol, in the end, kicked the tire at us, and the people loved it and left there happy. And that's the reason why I messed with them at the start of it. It was mind games with the wrestlers. So you find out then who your stooges are, who's going to go behind your back and knife you in the back. So Monday morning, I was in the office for David Woods to come in to say, after about 10 minutes of our meeting, and he goes, by the way, I heard John Gillum work the main event in Dalton. And I said, yeah. And he said, how come? And I knew he'd heard you know, a lot, probably a lot of different stories, and I gave him the full story. And he understood, and he got a big kick out of it. And, and uh, that was my greatest John Gillum story. Worked the main event built into a sold-out crowd. That's it. So you can do it with anybody. If you brought all this business up in Alabama, why the hell did, did it, were you forced out? Uh, the, the, the worst problem in our business is that, is, is that it's like right now what's going on is that the reasons why, like, everyone's happy, and I'm, I'm talking about everyone. I think everyone out there knows what I'm talking about. Is people want to knock uh, Vince McMahon or knock our business or knock Ted Turner, um, uh, you know, who he's hiring and whatever. And we're so into that that we don't. Uh, and, and guys, it's just like the guys in our business are always hoping that this booker come. You know, if this booker that comes in doesn't do exactly with that person what they think should be done, well, they're going to knock him in the back and let's get somebody else in here. And, and that struggle, that power struggle, goes on from day one when the booker takes over. As with the boys, you've got to try to keep harmony. But there's always those few, those select few that think they can do the job a little bit better or have a person they can that will keep them in the right spot. Uh, it had grown there. I guess uh, I think David Woods thought that I had gotten too independent. Uh, but that's just the way I work. That's not anything to do. That's nothing personal. Uh, I, I think David Woods, I think a year later, me and him talked and everything, he said he'd know me like he'd he be, he become to know me after I worked for him. He would understand that, but I like to be left alone and, and uh, really not be bothered by uh, George Steinbrenner type owners that want to have hands on. I'm better off just being left alone. And Bill Watts did that when he gave me the job. He never, I never heard a word from him or anything. But that's um, the reason. I think it's power, um, other people greedy, and um, well, Bishop. Business fell off pretty quick after you left. Uh, he he had to fold up like four months later. I think, so. Well, didn't he? Catch, didn't he get a clue after, you know, a couple of months? Yeah, I had an idea when I was, before I went back, see, after, uh, no, before I went back to Memphis in 90, uh, when I when I felt that, that my time, my tenure with the booking committee in WCW was coming to an end, I made a, a proposal to David Woods that I would come back and that uh, he and I had talked about this thing, and I think it was another deal too, I want to be half owner, Actually, I'd like to be the owner, but that, the half owner of the Alabama thing, if you know, if my salary was cut down and so forth and so on. And so I had an idea of rerunning our old tapes with Paul E. And, and well, was Paul had already been let go from WCW. And uh, Paul E. and Charlie uh, Platt, Charlie Platt, uh, who was our, our show host and everything, uh, redoing the shows. Like I say, this was from this time. re showing over like six weeks and then restart up the Alabama territory. But I just... Uh, they didn't like Paul E, and they didn't understand Paul, and I did, and I just didn't want to go back there without him, and uh, David didn't really like Paul at all, and that, that i got to be honest with you, too, that was another reason why David and I had this 
misunderstanding stuff too. Paul, that you know, Paul is like me a lot of times. He will say things that maybe he shouldn't, uh, but uh, he does uh, for the best interest of the business and, and himself and everybody else. And uh, David Woods took it the wrong way and thought a lot of times it was me saying it when it was Paul Lee. So that was one of the problems. Where, now, where do you go from, uh, from Alabama? Alabama, I go back to WCW. I go back in. That's where Ricky Steamboat and I do the uh, match with Barry Wendell and Rick Flair on TV. I go back like two months. Uh, I re- me and Ron Simmons wrestled the Fantastics on a clash for the United States Tag Titles. I remember the Fantastics won it because I went in with a hurt arm or something, and, and they worked on that. And then I, I missed a turnbuckle or something. And that night, though, I found out before I went through, and Jimmy Crockett told me that. Ricky Steamboat was coming in, and Rick Flair wanted to work a program with me that made my night, and uh, work with Barry Windham, and I was real happy about that too. I've always had respect for Barry, and uh, so I went from that thing with the Fantastics to uh, working the thing with Ric Flair and Barry Windham on TBS. Brought Ricky Steamboat in as my partner, and uh, we were together till uh, see. I think George Scott came in, took over the booking. Then I became Rick Steiner's tag team partner, and we got the U.S. Tag Belts. Missy was managing us, and not long after that's when George Scott was let go. Wooden committee was put together, and we hear some people yelling outside the room right now. But <laughs> the wooden committee was put together. I got a call to be on that with uh, some other good gentlemen and uh, conflict of personalities. And uh, we went from there with the committee. And, and, and I kind of withdrew myself from the road as far as wrestling because I knew then that I really wanted to be in the office more than on the road. And that was in the latter part of 89, I guess. March of 89 is when I got on the wooden committee. Came off the wooden committee in about November, December of '89, and uh, wound up coming back to Memphis in '90. And then, man, how long was that stay? Wow, that was a long. That was tired. That, that was until uh, well, that sort of went into the good heart. Uh, yeah, see, uh, that that uh, also in '90 is when me and Missy busted up, and, that, and there was a lot of things that played on that too. At the end of the wooden committee run. Um, Kevin Sullivan was on there. He had his, his girlfriend, whatever, Nancy, uh, using her some stuff. Flair liked her. Flair made the power play to get the booking job. Got it. Uh, Missy was off TV. Uh, Missy's ego didn't like that too much, and, and, and I understand that, but it's very hard dealing with that at home. And also me working in the office on the committee, me getting blamed because she wasn't on TV and was supposed to stay at home. It was very hard very complex situation. It was, it was a time when I wish that we could have separated business and personal, but it, it was both, and uh, it wound up being too much for the one of section of so We uh, ended the marriage in, in 90, and, and I came back home. I thought coming back home, I felt better. I wanted to come back, and uh, that's when I first uh, hurt my arm, my shoulder that I knew of. I, I first heard it in 1985. Match with Randy Savage in Evansville, Indiana, and I come off the top row with an elbow like this, I'll use left arm to show you. And as I came down, Randy stood up and his head caught under my elbow and shot my arm straight in the air and I heard a pop. And from that day on, my, my shoulder just gave me trouble. And then as I, the more bumps I took, the more things I did with it, the worse it got. And, and in 90, I remember like in uh, about March of 1990 in a match with the Freebirds, and Johnny uh, Ace was my partner somewhere in North Carolina somewhere. And uh, I remember reaching out for the ropes to pull myself up with my right arm, and I couldn't pull. And I knew then, and I went home, and I called the doctor, WCW doctor, and I went to him like three times. He did these tests. Uh, he didn't find the tear. I felt like it was being railroaded kind of a little bit. Is that a rotator cuff? Yeah, because uh, I, I knew that I had been, you know, I wasn't on the end real good with WCW at this time. I mean, I am a wrestling job, still under contract, getting my money, uh, but I knew I wasn't uh, politically in with the booking committee or the booker being Rick Flair. Uh, about that time also, he lost his job. Ole took over while I was hurt. And that's also another decision. I just wanted to get out. Jim Hurt let me out of my contract, and I came back to Memphis in 1990. That's when I got the booking job in Memphis, I guess like two months later, my first full-time booking job uh, in Memphis. And uh, uh, we had the big tournament in Memphis for the world title, about Funk and Idol and Dick Murdoch, Dick Slater, people like that, and had a twenty-something thousand dollar house, I think, that night. Uh, built towards that. Enjoyed that stuff. Got to work with Jeff Jarrett in a, in a program for the Southern Title, where I got to talk about him wanting to be the future owner of the of the territory and want to write my checks. I had fun saying that. And then in turn, I let him talk about my marriage being a, a 
was to miss either. So we, we had a few people believe in us, I think, and I enjoyed that. And then I got to work with Lawler again, and that's when we did the car angle. And I remember, yeah, I remember, <laughs> I got to tell you this story. He may not ever say it's true, but it's, but it's funny, though, because I remember we was leaving Louisville one day. We was leaving Louisville one day, and, and he had pulled up this place to eat and, or get gas, and I was behind him. And I got out, I said, can I ride with you a ways? And, and Doug drove or something, and, and John, I think, was with us, too, and I rode with Lawler. And we were saying about stuff to do that hadn't been done in Memphis. That's very hard. I mean, unless you just shoot somebody, and I think I may have some coming up. No. But, but I think, <laughs> That's on either. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe, you know, now I mean, we laughed about stuff like that. And I was just sitting there thinking, and we were saying, we was looking out the window. And I remember we almost got all the way to Evansville. And still nothing to really come out. And I just remember looking out the window and going, because he said, even if we got outside the studio, and I said, yeah, so what can we do? Because I'd already done a thing where I'd body slam him through the windshield back in 88. They were a parking lot brawl with it. So I couldn't do that. And so I was thinking, I said, you know, I'd be really great. And I remember just looking, and I said, now you may think I'm crazy. And I used that, that line from Terry Funk when he tells you an idea. You may think I'm crazy, you think I'm And But I said, you may think I'm crazy with this, but I think, you know, if I came at you with a car, do you think you could jump in time? You know, like, it looked good. It looked good. I'm going to look good. It looked good. It looked good. I'm telling you, it looked good. And he went, you know what? When I was in high school, I did that as a stunt one time. And I went, wow. I'm going, he's, yes, he's going to go for this. And, and he did. And he went for it. And we, another good trivia thing is with this, too, you can ask Brian Lee the story because he was there at TV that morning. I driven my forerunner Toyota pickup truck that I have uh, to the TV so naturally we couldn't do the do the run over with my truck because it's too high and it just went over Jerry so it really wouldn't be an angle after that I'd be in prison and be my last angle so uh, so beforehand I, I'm going I need a car I need a car I need. so I go to Brian Lee Doug had talked to Brian and they've been real good friends I didn't really know Brian that well Brian can I borrow your car yeah man it's not really my car but it's my girlfriend's car, and, and our, or somebody's car. I just want to say that. some person's car. I don't, you know, whatever. Somebody's car, his friend's car, and and so he said, yeah, but just he's not going to dent the hood or anything, is he? And I said, no, 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 no. He's going to jump, and he's just going to hit the thing and roll off, and it'll be over with. He said, okay, man, just you know, don't don't dent it up. It's not my car. I said, okay, don't worry about that. Don't worry about a dent. He will not dent it, and he didn't. It thing punched so fast whenever I when I take off from this thing, and he didn't realize it either. I didn't think of whatever I forget it was a Ford Taurus. or something, yeah, Taurus or something. But I didn't think it had to pick up from the point where I was at, and it did. When I hit the floorboard, I remember seeing Eddie Marlin still standing, there thinking, "I'm going to hit him." And what do I do? I can't stop. It's live TV, and I go straight. And Lawler went to jump, but I was too fast for him, and it knocked him up. It, it, it hit his leg that he broke in a football game back in 77 or 78 or something, it hit him in the side of the leg there, and it knocks him up on the car when you see the thing. And the first thing that I remember seeing whenever I hit him was his ass in my face through the windshield. He busted the windshield of the car. He didn't dent it, the hood. He busted the windshield, but his rear end was right in my face. And then he went over the top. And I remember it was so bad, the feeling of it and, and the hit, and the lick and just the feeling, the adrenaline going on at the time because I thought, you only get one take at this, you know. And plus, I mean, and that's just, but it's live TV. Nothing's been rehearsed. I mean, you know, I have rehearsals in wrestling. And, I mean, it's not rehearsals. And, I mean, not for my stuff. Anyway, so, and, and, there, and going at a guy on live TV, it's life or death. And you don't know for sure what, what's happening. I remember driving off with Doug and I stopped for a very short second on, on the tape or slow down. And what I say to Doug is, do you think he's okay? And Doug turns around and looks and says, I think you killed him. <laughs> and I remember like, oh, no. And I drove on off. And I, dro I drove on off, and we pulled out of the parking lot. We went up, and there was like a Poncho's Mexican restaurant like two blocks up. And the and the winch, and I'm and I, now by now I'm going, what do we tell Brian? You know, what do we say to Brian? He's just going to kill me. You know, I'm not worth now I'm down. I killed a guy. And I got the windshield to take care of. This guy's going to be dead either way here. I think about prison. I'm turning this, this restaurant to turn around to go back to the TV station. 
and all of a sudden these boys are watching it on TV on the inside. They come around and say, oh, you just ran over Laura in the car. He's dead. Ah. And they're, they're yelling at me and laughing. And I, oh, man, we got to get back, Doug. And I pulled back down the street, and I let Doug out in front of WMC Channel 5. I said, go in and tell Brian about his windshield before I get back in here. I said, go in and because you're better friends with him. You can explain this to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's, a, there's a Mr. Pride car wash right next to the WNC Channel 5 across from it there. And so first thing I think about is trying to make this car look as clean as possible when Brian sees it. So I pull, this is during the TV show. I pull into Mr. Pride. The windshield is broken. I get out. All of a sudden I hear an ambulance coming. I get out. This lady comes out and says, what can I do for you? And I said, well, the... Uh, can you back him out with glass in here? I just ran over Jerry Lawler right over part because I wanted to make sure she knew it was wrestling. I didn't know if she knew me, knew anything, and I just wanted to, don't ask any questions. I've got to get back. Can I leave the car here? Can you? And she, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look what he did. He went over Jerry Lawler. So I go trotting back up the sidewalk. Now I see the ambulance pulling into the park line. I'm going, oh, he is. He is. He's hurt. I, I've done it. You know, I've done it. This is the one. This is. I, you know, this is the guy I probably have more respect for than anybody, and I probably just just ended everything of him. His legs were no telling what. But I just remember I figured his ass had to be broke. So, so, <laughs> so anyway, so I remember getting back into the studio. Lawler was in the back, but he's sitting there, and he's got his pants up, and the bruise is there, and then his hip is already turning black and blue from the deal. And I'm like, oh my god, oh, I'm just worried about this now. I'm, I'm pacing the floor and went, oh, you, you need to go to the doctor get x-rays, the whole deal. Uh, the ambulance is outside. The ambulance was there because a wrestling fan in Memphis, a bunch of them, had called them, not anybody from the TV station. Wrestling fans watching the show, the live show, called the ambulance to come and get him. Also, what the wrestling fans went ahead and did for us is they called the police to come and get me because we wound up having three uh, different uh, sets of policemen, two you know, two guys coming in uh, each time, three different times, to come to the front to get me. And they held them off, giving them some reasons that I had left or nothing really happened. Or And they said, well, we have to do something because it's on a, it was on it was Channel 5 parking lot and the fans had called in. They were going to have to do anything. Even if there was no charges pressed, they still had to question me or whatever. After the third time, I figured it was about time I left TV. So Doug and I snuck out the back door. After we left, they said like 10 minutes later, cops pulled up and like just um, just closed everything off. Every entrance, everything, they went in and looked for me, and I was already gone. And a lot of them were scared for the Monday night that they tried to come after me that Monday. And even when he went, and a lot of people said when he goes back out on the show, he kills the credibility of the, of the car uh, lick and everything. But what he did was just trying to save my hide. Because if he had remained that way, everyone would have thought he's probably dead or half dead, even though he looked like Superman walking back out there. Believe me, he was not Superman. He was hurt, and he was hurt real bad. But he was just trying to save me and my, you know, uh, my scalp on the thing by letting the people know at home that I'm better. I'll be there Monday night. I won't kick his rear end. Da 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 da. So the, when I look back at it, I wish too that he had taken off like two months. <laughs> you know. And I even said, even if I had to go to jail for a week, if it'd get a wrestling angle over publicity of and everything, I'd just about do anything for business. <laughs> I'd have stayed in jail seven days. If it, if it would have done the right business, I would have done it. So, you heard it here first. <laughs> okay, that was the car angle. Yeah, because that was a big misconception. Most people, I've had about half a dozen people call me this week and ask them if he hit the accelerator hard on purpose. I, no, no, yeah. no, I did That was Lawler and I, was, we were scared that it would look like I was going slow. That when we had talked about it, we kept saying to, to, to each other, and I was saying it to him, because before I went out there, he said, make sure you hit it, or, you know, don't. And I said, don't worry. Uh, it's live TV. You don't have to worry. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to get one star in Dave Meltzer's sheet. I want four for this angle. And so, <laughs> and he didn't go on the gas fast enough, so we're going to have to take a star away there. You know? So I did. I went on it fast, and, and uh, but not on purpose. On purpose to get the angle over, not on purpose to hurt me. You know, maybe to run over Eddie Marlin. <laughs> I think you guys in a wheelchair. Um, he needs that beer. Uh, how long? How long were you booking in Memphis? In Memphis? Were you still booking? You weren't booking when you went to Goodhart, were you? When I went to Goodhart? When you, when you, you first started working for Goodhart, was that ninety one or something? No, it was during this time. I made some chips up there with Lawler. Uh, 
It was during about the same time I was doing the booking job. I don't think, you know, I went back because I worked the Cactus Jag matches while I was uh, booking and not booking and, and so forth. Uh, it went, uh, I went through 90 till Christmas or something like that around January. And, uh, uh, Memphis is the probably the worst place in the world to try to be a booker unless you're part of the owner or from one of the families or something because it's uh, you got to please about nine different people and it's very, very hard because uh, you can't please everybody. And after a while, it gets frustrating and it's not worth it. And I saw that and I just asked to be pulled away from it. And, and I did that till about January of 91, I guess. I took it uh, like a month off. Missy and I went on a skiing trip, a lot of people know this, in January of 91, went to Aspen for a week. And uh, we thought we talked about getting back together and stuff like that, didn't do it. Um, just I, th- I think things that just went to, you know, she had her deal, I was happy at home. And so we t- I set a nice vacation away, got back home, had never been switched baby face in Memphis before. And that was the first time at Lawler uh, finally uh, decided to let that happen. And, and uh, we did with Eric Embry, he came in booking, and uh, Tom Pritchard was his partner, and, and we worked with him with me and Lawler. And we had never been partners before, and Lawler and I only did it for a week or something as partners or something. So uh, that was the first time for that. I don't know where we're at now. Well, that's all right. Well, go to, I want to talk about the Goodhart shows. Okay. Cactus Jack. We're in 91. Did you, did, I mean, you must have known because in the first match with Jack that you guys had just a No, we didn't. I'm yeah. glad you brought the that. Yeah. Great. That's great. Very natural. He's a natural. The first match that he and I had, and if you ask him this, he'll tell you if he really thinks back about it. The first match that we had was like a 15-minute draw, I think, in Philadelphia, the first match. It stunk. It was the worst match. I probably And going out there in front of the hardcores and knowing what kind of match you got to have. And, and what was funny was that Jack or I, neither, did, neither one of us knew whether we were babyface or heel in Philadelphia. Because when I came back up, I, the last day they seen me, I was a babyface in Atlanta. Cactus Jack looks like a heel, but he had his hardcore following and uh, so it was like split and we weren't working the right way we were just having a regular match we didn't know what was yet to come until the first time that we were booked in a gimmick match and that's what we asked to be booked in whatever that was the next time I'm trying to remember what that was the first of the series whatever that was so much of it so when we came back in our first gimmick match it's when we took off and we, we were just able to kill each other and go all over the building and Whatever came next, we uh, we just went with it. If I saw him with the umbrella and he was about to hit me, he just hit me. If he, we got up on a table and he picked me up for a pile driver, it was just coming. Uh, whether the uh, table stayed there when he come down, a lot of times it didn't. It just went down too. Uh, okay, but what about when you dump the trash can and you pick up a bottle? Yeah, that was our, oh man. Because <laughs> it looked like you were thinking for half a second, should I or shouldn't I? Good, I did a good job. No, it, that, that was a... Uh, that was another time too that we always try to think about what uh, what can you do that haven't been done and stuff like that and uh, everything about that was uh, very much so uh, that was a it was a wine cooler bottle so if you you know how hard those things are uh, that's how hard it went over his head because what I had to worry about when I hit him with it was to make sure uh, that I hit him hard enough that it did break and that was what I took the time out looking a couple. Of that, that's a thought because first off, you I didn't know it's a small bottle, and I, first off, hitting like this with it, I don't know whether when it breaks if it's going to uh, stab me in the hand, cut me, how bad it's going to cut him, um, and, and I just knew though, but because him and I both had just laid our bodies on the line for each other for these matches, and we knew that we couldn't go out there and do any less for anybody else. The people that paid to see it, but Joel Goodhart uh, for ourselves. And, and for everybody else, I mean, we take too much pride in what we do. And that's the way he felt when he when he came off the um, side of the apron with his elbows, and he's just, you know, he's killing his hip. And I kept telling him, I'll keep telling him today, and if you see this, please quit doing that to yourself. So he comes off the apron with those, those big elbows on the floor, and he's killing his body. But we we agreed to do that when I went out there that night. Uh, when we got the garbage can down, saw the bottles, and I went, hell, this is great. And whacked him with it, and it busted. And it was a great feeling, but there was a lot of worry about it beforehand. But after it was over with, I was, I was happy. I remember seeing Cactus at the intersection beside the Marriott. We both didn't, we were so happy over the match that when neither one got showered at the arena, we were still bloody. We dried blood on us. 
tithes, all over our tithes, everything. But we're so like, yes, this is great. It did it. The bottle, did you see that? And you get carried back home. And we were so happy about that. I remember pulling up next to him at, at an intersection at a traffic light, and he was standing in a separate hotel. So I look over there, and he's saying, and I look, and there's all this tape around this guy. And I didn't know what he was driving. I didn't know what he was in. I was like, look, I said, man, that guy's been in an accident or something. He said, no, I looked over, and I looked in. He turns out, listen, gives me that funny-looking grin. And it was cactus with all this tape and bandage and all this. And he's walking into his hotel that way. And I walked into the lobby of the Marriott with all the wrestling fans there. And I had tape. I, I couldn't get my head stopped leading. I had a bad cut right here in the middle of it. And I had taken a tape and put a gauze pad on it and did it real tight, and it stopped. And Doug was with me, and he got we got inside, got up to the room, the Marriott room. Uh, I remember Stan Lane and Cornette and those guys were there. Tommy Rogers and Bobby Fulton were there that night because they were in the dressing room. And uh, Doug went out with them. I couldn't leave the room that night. I wanted to come down because I couldn't get my head to stop leaving. And I had to stay in the room all night. Like a, I had cabin fever. I wanted to see everybody. I wanted to talk to everybody. That was the hardest court bar scene coming there ever was. Yeah, and I wish. Yeah, I know it. Because a lot of times I do, I do enjoy getting to talk to a lot of people and getting their opinions and stuff. And, and that was one night I, I wish I could have come down. I couldn't. There was no way. That's the no one way. bar where the wrestlers get, a, get applause. When they come yeah, down. yeah. And that's a good feeling, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, those matches with Cactus were the. Uh, someone never forget there is I love watching some of them sometimes. Now what do you think when he flipped into the barbed wire and hung himself in that? He's nuts. I mean were you worried about him then? Because he, he lost a lot of blood that night. He had to go to the hospital that night, didn't he? Yeah. He, he lost a lot of blood a lot of night, so he, he lost some he lost uh I think the most blood he lost was the night of the bottle. And the, the barbed wire the barbed wire didn't the barbed wire probably did less than you know, than it looks like. Uh, just for the fact that, that you know that we, we tried to keep it off of it, it was very. I mean, he, this guy really and truly, this guy Cactus went out to really make sure y'all saw a good uh, action pack man and, and do stuff to himself just to inflict pain for your pleasure. And uh, he did that that barbed wire just for the, the fans to call you out. There. What happened in your second run recently back in Philadelphia? Well, a lot of good stuff, a lot of fun stuff. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a good, you know, in six months it was fun. That's what I agreed to when I went for six months. Uh, it was, uh, I think, in, in the end, uh, probably the thing that I'd probably say the best would be that, that uh, Paul Lee learned too well. So, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it was a good learn. In other words, they didn't want two buckets out there? Not really, no. He learned well from me. He knows how to direct his business. Uh, I trust him. What happened in Japan with that wing thing? That was my brother. And nobody ever, you know, nobody. Wait, ever. Who grabbed the mic that night? Cause I Doug, it. Doug, Doug, it was Doug. Let me, let me say this. God, boy, that's what kills me about so many things. Ooh, I'm so glad you came with us. But someone I feel sometimes so that I hear that I don't even take the time to answer it because I think it's so hilarious and outrageous and no one ever checks anything out to see what's true or false and then a lot of times people don't believe what's true or false anyway they make it up in their mind just about headlines we see today with anybody if Tanya Harding's already guilty and everybody's eyes whether she is or not you know Michael Jackson was guilty before whatever so I uh, the the wing thing was my brother but no one asked and and Doug had the wing deal to go over there and I was supposed to went back in June and I didn't make it because uh, we agreed for me not to come because I really needed to be in Philadelphia the last two weeks before the June 19th show against Terry Funk. I didn't go. Then they had the thing coming up uh, to the end of November, into the December tour this past year uh, where they wanted me to come. And I always wanted to do this. I always wanted to wrestle as a creature. That was another thing, too, because in Memphis I'd seen Dr. Frank and my dad had done Freddy Krueger and then Doug did Freddy Krueger in Japan. My dad did Freddy Krueger for the USWA. Uh, as a baby face and he did real good with it and, and that's where Doug got it was from my dad and so then they said I want to be Michael Myers I love Michael Myers from Halloween and they called him the boogeyman and like the first installment of it if you, if you remember so Doug come home to tell me I said what what monster am I and he said well you're going to be the boogeyman I went the boogeyman I thought Jimmy Van was the first thing I thought I said Jimmy Van or what 
He says, no, that, that guy from Halloween. I said, Michael Myers, all right. I love that mask, that plain white mask with the hair and, and, and wearing the Jason-looking stuff and, and walking. So I was looking forward to it. I was going to Japan with Doug for two weeks and, and they're having fun and getting away. And So I really love Japan. I love going over there. So being with Doug was a lot of fun, too. It was our first tour together out of the country. And we got over there, and uh, just the first week, I could tell Doug was... The Freddy Krueger gimmick was like, a, well, I guess, the top heel gimmick there. And Doug had worked real hard. He took some dives off some balconies over there. That, and he doesn't get credit for a lot of things. I, I think it's kind of bad. I think, you know, Doug gets overshadowed a lot of times. And, and I, I don't really appreciate that or like that either. And, and I wish a lot of people look at what he does sometimes as who he is and for what he is instead of right, keeping me out of anything. But Doug, uh, as a dark patron, did a good job, I think. And, and so with Freddy Krueger, he already dove off balconies. He'd done gimmick matches, he'd done fire, he'd done everything. So you could see that when Freddy Krueger went to the ring, the people were loving him, even though they're scared of him. So they had a big nail death match coming up, I think, uh, between Freddy Krueger and someone. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's whoever's. No, it was against uh, against the Leatherface, my part. Oh. Against Leather, eventually, it was going to be in January. They were working up to it, and then they were going to do something. But Doug didn't know what the finish was coming. So Doug had his own little politic thing going, and he had been there a whole year. And, and a lot of people don't look at that. Doug had been there a whole year, and then all of a sudden, I came in for a tour, uh, which is coincidental, seriously. And I was there, and a lot of power plays got to being done. Um, I remember one night, I, I do like to rib, I like to joke, and I do think so. If a promoter comes to me and tells me, like, you know, uh, make sure you don't give this gesture in the ring. Well, the first thing I do when I get in the ring is give this gesture. So, I mean, that's the way I've always been. But a lot of people know that. And so I have fun with it. But if someone tells you don't grab the microphone, Eddie, well, a lot of times I'll grab the microphone and just send them go, ugh. And so, and I don't say anything sometimes. I just do it to watch promoters melt back there. And it's fun. I just have a lot of fun with everybody. I took a fire extinguisher one night in Japan and, and, and went outside. I was, I was the boogeyman. I was Michael Myers walking around the floor when they introduced us for the a little celebration deal before the matches, and I go out there and take a fire extinguisher off the wall and turn it on, and all the fans go running. There's white stuff all over the building, and the promoter, that Ibaragi guy, and, and Victor Quinones, Ibaragi, though, he wasn't too happy at all. I saw this bad look on his face. He was mad at me. I thought, the hell with it. We're over here having fun anyway. So I get back to the dressing room, and Doug comes over to me and says, You won't believe this promoter. I said, What? He says, He wants to take $150 out of each of our payoffs. For, for this this deal you just did with, and I'm thinking, why do it to Doug? I'm the one that did it. Why do it to Doug? And uh, in the meantime, you got to understand the history. Uh, I think, and Dave Meltzer brought this up in his little remarks about it, which was great. I'm glad he did because no one else said it. Uh, uh, Mike Kirshner had been the Leatherface over there, and then he got uh, in some trouble protecting someone else, Mike Anthony, who was wrestling over for Wing at the time, protecting them in a fight with a bunch of marks uh, out in the, in the city of Tokyo. Got put in jail for like a few months. Was back in Florida. This guy, uh, Jason the Terrible, who came into wrestling wing at the same night that all this some fix and get to came up, this Jason the Terrible was being brought back. In the meantime, Jason the Terrible had sold, got Mike Kirshner's Leatherface gimmick out of his Ibaragi's house, his promoter. Jason the Terrible went into this house when Mike Kirshner was flown back to Florida, got this, let me say, allegedly got this, I know from back to but allegedly got this this, this uh, outfit, and he sold it uh, to the Japanese people that sell, resell stuff. Like sold it for $800. It probably wouldn't work 200 bucks. But when all the boys found out about it, they just hated this guy. I mean, when all the all the wing boys came to me and they said, this Jason the Terrible's coming back here next week, I'm talking about week number two on our tour, and we, we don't understand he's a thief. He's a thief. And... Uh, so we came up to our night, this night that, that all this happened, this tag match. It was myself and Leatherface against Freddy Krueger and uh, uh, the Tales from the Crypt thing. Uh, this monster deal. I can't remember the other thing, but this, you should watch Tales from the Crypt. Crypt, Keeper. Crypt Keeper, yes. Crypt, yeah, Crypt Keeper. So Freddy Krueger's partner. And also this night, Jason the Terrible is his first night back in. His partner is a, is a good Japanese guy there, and I can't remember his name, but he's one of the best ones to us. And I called him Jackie Fargo while I was there because he just reminded me of Jackie Fargo, and I, and I said that to him. And we had a good relationship, good rapport and everything. And, and this guy and Jason the Terrible were booked against the Moondogs. And Doug had got the Moondogs booked on the tour with us. And it was a real 
personal thing of Doug because Mike Kirsten was real close to Doug and they got to be close friends while they were over there, looked out for each other's back. Doug had told me all this stuff. Jason Terrible was coming back in who had no business being there and other guys liked him. So Doug said, two days before this, said, I'll tell you right now, if they want to beat, if they have Jason the Terrible to beat the Moondogs, I'll tell them I'll go out there and you'll beat me and I'll take my mask off and screw them and this promotion if that's what they think of someone that's, that's sweated and worked hard for them like Mike Kirshner did. And I said, well, Doug, you just do what you want to do. I don't, this is your deal. And I am not going to be part of it. I don't have anybody saying that Eddie went over there and did this. And that's exactly what wound up happening. But that night of the show, Jason the Terrible comes in the dressing room, shakes hands with everybody, leaves the room. I'm going, man, I sure hope they don't do what, you know, because I know Doug. And he's already said for a fact that if they do this, he, he's had it. So we wait for them to get the Moondogs and Jason and them together. Moondogs come back in, tell Doug what's going on in the match. Jason the Terrible's are winning the thing. Doug went ballistic. He said, where's the Ibaragi at? And so Doug got up. He went to Ibaragi, told him the whole thing. He said, I don't know why. Why a piece of shit Jason the Terrible come back here and you treat him like you do? And da, da, da. I was there. I heard the conversation. So did the Moondogs. And this Ibaragi had no answer at all. Then, you know, so things are fixed now. So Doug said, maybe with y'all, but not with me. And Doug says, I, if he if he wins, they could have had the Jackie Fargo guy win, is what I'm trying to say here, too. If Jason the Terrible wins the tag match, I'm going out there and pulling my mask off. Me, Rocky, just kind of laughed at him. Yeah, I know you won't. And I thought, oh, man, don't say that. And the guy left, and Doug looked at him and said, you know what to do? And I went, and the last thing I said to Doug in the hallway before we went out, I was going to my right, Doug was going to my left to go out his way. And I said, are you sure this is what you want to do? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I'm with you then. Because uh, not one, you know, we don't do things separate, and uh, there, there's loyalty both ways. We're family, and, and we, you know, we always stay there somehow. So when I saw him when he came in the ring, and then I grabbed him, and uh, I went for a uh, see what was it first? I think we went for a small package first, or sunset, one or the other. Sunset flip. I think sunset flip first. The referee wouldn't go down for the count. I think that they had already told him that if Freddy Krueger goes to get beat, don't go down for the count. And he got up and went towards Leatherface and Crypt Keeper outside the ring. And all the boys knew what was happening just about. And the referee didn't go down for the first time. We came right up, and Doug's cussing. I, I, I always laugh now when I tell the stories of Doug cussing while he's going backwards. Count me this time or whatever, and because he was so mad. And uh, I think the next time I saw Paxton, but it was one of the other first and the other second. And the one, two, three came, and Doug come up, and they started playing music, and... Uh, Freddy Krueger had never been beat, and then all of a sudden we beat him in the deal. Doug had done it for me for no reason. I had the first tour I'd been there, Boogie Man, big deal. Doug gets up, says, "Stop the music." He's got his Freddy Krueger mask on, and he goes through the story that it was a shit promotion and shit promoter, and that uh, they don't treat the boys good. And he takes his mask off, and he says, "My name is Doug Gilbert." And when I saw him do that, it was like this feeling, like, "Wow," you know. I mean, like Bruiser Brody. Could be here to see this. I think he'd have to say, "God bless y'all." I don't know, or "God bless Doug." At this point in time, because Doug, you don't ever see anybody in the business anymore. Well, I saw that a while ago that people don't stick up for each other. There's no loyalty to anybody. When I sit back and watch Doug be loyal to Mike Kirshner and to the Moon Dogs uh, for getting them booked over on the tour the way he did, and I thought, man, that's great to see that. And so that's what made me reach out and take my mask off. And I looked at him and he said, and "That's my brother, Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert." And and then the people were just like, just stunned, and that's fine. That's what we meant to do. And we got outside the ring, and then we high-fived and left the ring together and got back to back. I still had never said a word about anything. I just went to the dressing room. I told Victor Quinones he just shot himself in the head, though. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you just, you know, you could have changed this. This could have been detoured. And that's why a lot of people don't understand. They could have had the other baby face go over in the tag match with the Moondogs. I mean, you don't do your business that way and handle it that way. And uh, after it was over with, they wanted comments from us. And I told Doug, I said, this is your baby. I'm standing with you. I stood behind Doug on the tape with my hand on his shoulder. He did the talking. He told him again why he did it. And uh, and we left. We left the next morning. But this was, it was Doug's decision. I stood by him. And the last thing I told him, I said, you sure it's what you want to do? And when he did it, I was like, go for it. Man. Did you do any Japanese press interviews after that about that? That's what that was. That's what they, well, they never had a chance because we left the next morning. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh. That night, they took us off, and they had the camera, and they let some press be there with their pads. And then I talked to, I can't i can't remember which newspaper it was, but I talked to them the next morning from the airport because I knew the girl there. And I talked to her, and I gave her what really, you know, what caused what. 
even though I knew that some of them might not get said and some of them would. But I wanted, I wanted the story to be told, but it really never got told no, no, at all. But there was a lot of loyalty to it. And it, and just, i tell you what, it just, it's a bad thing that, that uh, I guess the bad part about it is that a Gilbert had to be involved in it because it, because at the same time, I mean, it just goes along with the, you know, the reputation of sometimes you're hard to deal with and get along with and stuff. Yeah. When we left them alone. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us bring up the present, but I wanted to um, go back to Tupelo, Mississippi. 1981. Yeah. yeah. Whose idea was that? And, <laughs> and the promoter comes in at one point and looks like, what did he do? The promoter and his wife. Yeah, well, the wife came in afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I've watched this thing so many times. <coughs> the promoter's dead now, Herman Sheffield. The Undertaker. Him and yeah, he, he started, he looked like he was starting to tangle with Tojo, but that was what that was worked, right? Yeah. That was worked, but then the wife comes in. Yeah. What, what was she, what was the she wife? She had a good before? reputation down around the blow. <laughs> she did? <laughs> Well, I guess a good old inside. Uh, yeah, she just had a good rep. She was involved in it. And, uh, uh, but the idea, I got to tell you, that you got to go back to 1979, I think, and, and get a tape of, that, of the... Ferris and Lincoln. Yeah, that, to me, well, that's what, see, what happened was is that when Ricky and I came back from Oklahoma in 81, him and I had been out there together for Leroy McGurk for three months, and we come back in as a team. We'd never been a team here in Tennessee. We came back in, took the bells from Onita and Fuji, our first Monday night back in, and Jerry, Jerry... Had this idea, uh, you know, came to me and said, Eddie, do you remember the, the angle on Tupelo? I said, yes, I do. And I, I thought, great, man. It's, it's right. You know, I just never got that chance. I think I think a good uh, um, example would be a person, when I started knowing characters and everything, baby face, and I just never been able to do a character, be a character in the business yet, even up to 81, that I could show any kind of, uh, that I had any kind of character at all to be. I, I was just Eddie Gilbert and go out there and wrestle in this baby face. So Ricky Morton and I had this chance to go to Tupelo, Jerry Jarrett, and do this concession stand angle. And Jerry Jarrett had us all come up to his house to watch the Larry Latham and Wayne Ferris and Bill Dundee and Jerry Lawler concession stand fight, which we remember from Tupelo. And uh, we watched the deal. I knew about it. And what gets me to this day is I remember Onita sitting in the in, in the chair watching the thing going, oh, 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 no. <laughs> I knew I thought, well, this is gonna be hard. And Onita got his two front teeth knocked out during this thing, and and then he didn't have any teeth here, and he really looked ugly. And they shaved his head, and, and he was a pretty boy then. And I mean, he thought, and and he hated this. He didn't like bleeding. He didn't like getting cut in the sand and do it. He didn't like getting beat up. He didn't like, you know, he didn't like the punishment. He didn't like dishing out either way. And uh, and, and it's great for me when I watch it now or, or think about it and knowing his reactions and knowing what he's been doing the past few years in Japan now with the bomb matches and the barbed wire when I knew that he hated this in the beginning. And, uh, and then when, and when we did the deal, it was just, I mean, we knew what, you know, what we was going And when we got in the concession stand, just Katie bar the door, whatever we got a hold of, we got to use. And I mean, I was looking for everything. That's the reason why I was happy when I got the mustard bucket and got the pork because I remember them using that in the, in the one with, uh, Lawler and Dundee and them, and I wanted to make sure we got some good stuff in there. Uh, we couldn't really get too close to the popcorn machine because that was real expensive or something. Uh, but, uh, man, I remember, and I also remember there were some boards that were laid in there that I was supposed to break over Tojo's head, but I got the wrong boards, and I was trying to break them over his head, and they weren't breaking. And they, he was going, God damn, God damn, ah, I did. He was, he was mad for a little fella. He was all, I, I couldn't understand. I said, I'm trying, but it was the wrong ones. He had placed these other ones on down under the thing. And, um, that, that was probably the sorest I'd ever been the next morning. I'd never been in anything like that. You know, I mean, my cactus stuff came 10 years later, and I'd never been involved in anything like that where you really take stuff. And, uh, because then it was like, to make this believable, we have to hurt each other. Because Larry Booker, Larry Latham, got like uh, 16 stitches in his head from that concession stand that night because Lawler had picked up a board with a nail in it, hit him over the head, and cut it. And they just kept fighting in that deal. You never knew Larry was, I mean, he was cut and he was bleeding, but you never knew where it was from or what happened to him, really. And we knew that we, I mean, we had black, I mean, I remember having a black eye that morning from it, and it was Tojo popping us in the eye, me and Ricky both. If you ever see it, Tojo gets close to us and he's, he's nothing that's right in the eye with it. I'm going to watch there. And, uh, we were very, very sore. I know they were. They were hurting. 
Uh, we did an angle the next morning on TV where I got beat up with a kendo stick, I told you. Uh, they showed all this stuff, I think, on one of the TVs in order, or out of order, in order, whatever, all this happened. I remember uh, Jerry Jerry telling told you, you know, make sure you whip him good because, Eddie, you'll get your chance later in the show. And Tojo did. He whacked me over here this Kindle stick thing. And he went to tell you, if you think those things don't hurt, you're crazy because they sound good. I mean, you think, oh, it's not hurt. It hurts bad, real bad. And then had places on my head from it. And Tojo whacked me over the back. I was thinking, oh, my God, I can't wait to get out of this thing. At the end of the show, I got to go back in on Tojo. with the, They were his, on Eden and Fucci on the TV show that day after the concession stand by, um, I guess, Dutch Mantel and Steve Kern. And I remember going in the ring. I had my head... I had the Spirit of 76 thing bandaged around my head, and um, I had the Kindle. So I got the Kindle stick from Tojo or something, and I just way late then good. I mean, I remember taking off across the ring like with a baseball bat. I mean, I beat Tojo over the back. But, he, but see, that I didn't know that. that uh, I mean, I've known Tojo all my life. grew up knowing Tojo, but I didn't know that he loved uh, pain. So he wanted me to hit him harder every time I hit him with this thing, and I thought, I'm getting it. I'm getting it back what he did to me. And then all the time, he's loving it. He wouldn't leave the ring. He just kept holding the ropes, you know, kind of like I was saying I was doing it with Watts, but he was doing it because he loved it, though, and he wanted me to hit him harder. Um, but we did a lot of good stuff in that thing. Tojo come out uh, during that program with Onita and Fuji uh, during the concession stand. They told you to come out and talk about my, I got to be the spokesperson for the team, which, you know, I, I appreciated at that time with Ricky, and uh, he understood it. He let me go ahead, and I had to, like, the lead of the thing with the, with the tag angle, and, and Tojo would come out and talk about my mother and dad and spit in my face. And, Everything and we had a real personal issue in that thing. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> three, three more subjects. Okay. Uh, Jim Ross. <laughs> <laughs> We're diet smelling in here. No. Oh. Uh, uh, well. Michael person loves power. I guess everybody does, but I think I think uh, I, I would just hope that I would have more respect. That I would have more respect for my friends and people that uh, I worked with to get where I, I became or, or came to be. Remembering those people and not try to walk over them or, uh, and stuff. And then you know. It, it, Jim and I, I mean, God, Jim and I go back to 1981 is what's bad about it in Oklahoma. And, 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 and Jim actually helped me get the booking job in UWL. And I guess where Jim and I first started coming apart at the scenes as far as being friends was in 87 during the sellout of UWL. If I kind of in my head, and I guess still do, even though he's denied it and, and he says that I'm wrong, and I, I, you know, I don't know. There's not any really proof. Jimmy Crockett's never told me one way or the other, so I don't know. Of, of what happened in that deal, I, I really, I heard Jim Ross too many times saying what NWA needs is me on TBS, somebody himself as an announcer taking Tony Schiavone's place and everything. So I remember that when the sellout came, I got the call from Jim Ross about the sellout of UWF and uh, when it was coming and, and what it was about, and and, I, and he was the one to set the deal up. And I pretty much in the back of my mind always felt that, that and I took that kind of personal. I loved UWF, and I hated seeing the people lose jobs and did. And I never forgot it. And then we got to WCW, and he and he was a very good politician. He moved up uh, real good. He got, he got uh, I guess, you know, he got under the right people. If he, uh, Jim, if you let him get that foot in the door there, he, he'll sure get into the room with you, like uh, Crockett, got in with Jimmy. And uh, um, he finally worked his way into being on the booking committee, got more power. I think there was a power struggle there between Flair and Jim Ross on the, on the committee, too. Uh, that came after I was gone. I think I was the first problem or whatever. And then uh, after that, and Jim's just Jim's had a lot of stuff involved in the personal and professional with me, so I don't get too much involved in him but as far as opinions. But uh, he's been successful. I guess that's a lot of love. Okay, what do is that? I think she's a great athlete, great wrestler. She's a good person, good-hearted person. I think her and I, I think the, uh, it was just a, a meeting in the wind or something like this. I don't know what it was, but it was, uh, it was nice while it lasted, but it wasn't meant to be. It was uh, fun uh, getting to know her. I didn't really know her up until I met her in Philadelphia. Uh, I 
good heart shows, and we done a mixed tag together, and from there we kind of uh, were together from there on. And uh, uh, but she's she's really a good person. I think she deserves uh, getting out of the business what she can, and uh, she deserves to you know, make as much money and be as successful as she can. I, I'm really proud she got this shot with WWF. Too. And what ever happened with that debacle with that kid Gordon Cesari up in? Somewhere in New England, an AWF thing where you were supposed to be the booker. And yeah, man. Yeah, that was another weird story, too. But, it, I mean, it's very short. And, and I was supposed to go up there for the deal. And the whole thing was that he sent me a plane ticket from that. The plane ticket I got, one of these cheap deals, and you know what I'm talking about, that was from Dallas. It was from Atlanta to, to uh, where it's Massachusetts, where we was going. And it wasn't from Dallas. And I was in Dallas on Friday night. I, I couldn't get there. I took this ticket of his when I tried to change it. Couldn't do it. Couldn't get there. Uh, I called. The, the first night that I couldn't get there, I called on the, on the Saturday night late, I was on a hookup with Gordon and this other guy that was the, uh, that was doing, he, had a, he got all the cameras together and the lighting together. I can't remember his name right now, but he was the one that set it up between me and Gordon. He was on the phone, too. I told him that I would fax them. I had already faxed them the TV as I had laid out. But they had said they hadn't got them, which I, I knew that I had faxed them to them. Uh, then I went in and faxed them to the hotel that night, told them to call me the next morning, like on a Sunday morning. I had already missed the Saturday night. Uh, I said, prepay me a ticket on Sunday. I'll be there and clear all this up. I don't understand what the deal is with the ticket anyway, why you couldn't get it from Atlanta. I never heard from them again after that night. And I knew then that uh, they had already talked about so many different people. I already said they'd do it. And four or five different people went up booking this show. And all this kind of deal and, and so everything got really just messed up on the thing and it was just actually Gordon really not knowing what he's doing in the first place and I was in Dallas uh, booking Dallas at the global thing and Jeff Gaylord shows up for a job and I remember I, I didn't wrestle Doug in a match and I was bleeding I was tired I was in the dressing room I remember sitting like this here Joe Pestine was across from me um, the Johnson guy that's the announcer Oh yeah, Craig. Craig Johnson and John Horton, real name. So, you know, Bonnie Blackstone's in the room, and I'm sitting there just with my head down, going, "Cause we done two tapes, two tapings that night, and it was the last match, and I done laid out all the finishes, done the match, da 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 da, everything up to the end. I was very tired, drained, sitting there. I saw Jeff Gilbert walking past and forth through the uh, front of the room, outside the entrance, and I looked out, I said, "What do you need?" He said, "I need to talk to you." So I went outside, talked to him. He was exchanging stuff back and forth with me about wanting to come to work. I said, okay. I said, and I started walking with him through the sportatorium dressing room. It's like a little maze through there. It's like three different rooms and stuff. We go from one room to another. And I remember asking him, say, have you got one of my business cards? You got my number? Because he'd been calling Scandal or Akbar for a job. And Akbar never told me the messages that he wanted to work on a Friday night or anything. And I said, do you have my home number? And he says, no, I don't. So Barry Horowitz, I remember, saying, Barry, will you run out to the car and get my... Uh, business man. He said, sure. I gave him the keys. He runs out through the maze that I just come walking through to get the cards. So Jeff Gaylord and I go walking back through the maze once again to back towards the front office room where I had left where I'd been with Joe Pesino. And I had got in front of Jeff going through the thing, the dressing rooms. And I remember going through one of the dressing rooms open and all of a sudden I felt this like battering at the back of my head. Just punches. I didn't really know what was going on. I thought I just all of a sudden felt these punches. I remember turning around, trying, I didn't even know who it was. That's how baffled I was. I turned around, I had my arm up trying to block the punches to see who it was, and I saw his Gaylord. And I couldn't figure out what this guy, why would Jeff Gaylord first off be hit me? Why would he wait till I turn my back, this big fur? You know, why wouldn't he just say, I want to kick your ass or something? I mean, don't, I mean, fight me. Don't, don't just, I mean, sucker punch. I mean, man, that happens every day and it's easy. But I turn around and these, but, I, I was on my feet. I had my arm up. I was trying to block. And the next thing I hear was you SOB. And Doug came charging across in front of me. And I remember hearing this crack of a like glass busting. And I looked up and Doug and I was like Cactus Jack. Uh, Doug he took a Pepsi bottle and hit Gaylord right in the head with it. And just busted. And Gaylord started bleeding and turned and he ran out of the sportatorium. He jumped in his car through gravel. Doug chased him out. And I remember walking into the pit scene on everybody. Everyone at first thought it was a wrestling angle because I was always doing goofy stuff. So they just thought I was doing an angle at first, and, and no one really thought I was serious. And I, and I stood there a minute because, I, I mean, the punches were enough that at first time I'd ever been light-headed from punches. 
and uh, and Doug came back in and told me what happened. And then we found out Gordon Cesare sent over a thousand dollars of uh, oh, I think she really, um, uh, Chris Cruz uh, called me and um, Gordon Cesare telling him that uh, yes, he paid Jeff Fielder to come and uh, uh, do the number on me, whatever he's supposed to do. I always thought, and all of us laughed later. A lot of the wrestlers and everything said that. B. Lord was so stupid, he should have come to me and said, hey, I'll give you 500 bucks if you were just, you know, <laughs> act like you're, or tell him that I've laid you up two weeks or something, but B. Lord didn't know he's burnt out in the head, so uh, <laughs> he didn't know, and, and then, uh, so I went home, and I, I still, it was a shock to me, because I never thought, first thought I thought I was past anything like that, I never thought, then I got to thinking, man, just how crazy this business is, I thought, wow, well, at least I'm now getting to make sure I feel every aspect of it, now I've been jumped. Went through the John Tatum stuff, everything, never a fight. Then I'll get jumped by Jeff Gaylord. And and, and so I remember getting home, and, and Medusa and I were together, married, living together. And she, I remember getting real mad about this thing. And she was going, I think, Boston or some, somewhere up there to work. And uh, she knew that he'd be at the show. And she told me, she said, I'll get it. And she did. Uh, she called him over to talk to him. And the, everything, the story, all the stories I've heard is that, uh, so there were some friends of his out there. She said she wanted to see him to talk to him, like she's going to be real nice. And then she got him over there and gave him two or three kicks or something and knocked him out or something. So <laughs> I was real proud of that when I heard about it. I was real happy. So I figured everything got pretty well. And I'm working with Jeff Gaylord here, and, and Jeff's just, I, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask you about is Sabu. Why is it taking him? For sure, for you, he'd have been the perfect guy. Well, he's got his Japan thing first. Yeah. I think the guys make it as complicated as they want to make it. it I, I, what I mean is making it in the business and making problems. And he's not making any problems. He's a great guy, and I, and I like him a lot. And I, and I, and I think he's a great guy. I think he's, uh, he's a cactus jack, and we don't have the, the shows. Yeah. That's what it is. If you look, the things aren't going on. If all these, thus far, they would get him in the ECW thing, but. Uh, before that, I, I had made mention about Sabu uh, at ECW, and remember you got to have the owner going along with you and everything. Maybe Paul made the different pitch at a different time. and couldn't get him at the time I wanted to because I thought that would be a perfect opponent for me after fun, uh, and I finished. And I, and I thought that would be fun, especially with the fire. I wanted to bring the Sheik into it and bring Funk back as my partner and everything. Never got to do that stuff. And uh, Sabu is a great, great talent. I think that when he wants to come in, see, the loyalty thing plays a big part again. He's being loyal to Onita. He hasn't uh, went over, you know, he's had his trial for WCW or whatever the deal. I don't know about WWF or whatever. I can't remember right now, the hearsay or whatever. And uh, it's up to the ECW. I knew he wouldn't make a commitment with them uh, because of Japan. So I think it's up to him. Uh, when he really wants to make it, he will. He's got his uncle there, a very, very smart man, uh, knows how to uh, play hard to get. And I think that's one of the, the best mind games you play in this business, play hard to get. <laughs> That's funny, you got about an hour and fifty. That's great. <laughs> I'm just thinking of old stories here. Ooh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it's like watching it's like watching Memphis TV right, yeah, without the commercials. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, you know, um, something about any of the other words. Hey, guys, I've had a. Anyway, so you know, he 